Welcome to the latest edition of the Shukri Rights Podcast with your host, Shukri Rights. Today, we are doing a trifecta, meaning that it's going to be me and two guests, but two guests that I've had most recently on the podcast. First, starting off with Lauren Campbell of Nesson, content producer, as well as part of the member of the Nesson Bruins podcast. And also, also joining the podcast today is Matthew McCarthy um, of 98.5 The Sports Hub, also joining the podcast as well today. How's everybody doing? Shukri, great to be on with you, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm at least doing well. I can't speak for Lauren, but I'm doing great. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm also doing great. So, Matt, if you did want to speak for me at that point, that would have been fun because I <laughs> Another day, just happy to be happy to be here. <laughs> All right, I can report Lauren is doing great. <laughs> See, she's fired up me, to be here. She's giving you the green light, and and you proceeded with caution, smart move. But I am doing great, with the exception of the Celtics. And and um, and I, listen, this this podcast is going to be one hundred percent Bruins. But goodness grief, like after last night, I don't know what I was expecting last night. I figured that, well, I just got back from Florida, true story, and I'll go watch the Celtics because they're just filling in time. Maybe they'll actually show up for game two. Just give me a pin, a bobby pin, and stick it in the balloon because any air of hope went out of the window within the first five minutes. So I'll start, I'll start with you, Lauren. Um, your thoughts on last night's absolute uh, ramsacking of the Celtics in Brooklyn. So I didn't turn it on until the second half, which I mean, it was pretty much over at that point, (laughs) but you know, it was within minutes that my Twitter timeline was just like, oh, here we go again. Oh, Celtics. Oh my God. The series is over. So I was like, um, okay. Everyone's pretty unhappy right now, but I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I certainly did not expect the Celtics to, I mean, I'm expecting them to get swept, but it was, uh, a very not inspiring performance at all and didn't help losing Tatum in the second half either. But it was just, I mean, the Nets are good, but they're just making the Celtics look silly. Yeah, I mean, here's the major takeaway. I mean, the Celtics are just rolled over and died last night. The way that they've rolled over and died the vast majority of this season, this thing needs to end, all right? This season needs to end. I can't take this anymore. I can't believe I'm paying a cable bill to watch this. Like I, I, I want to sue the Celtics. Like this is this is an embarrassment. I, I can't, I can't take this team anymore. And you know what the really frustrating thing is, guys? Like y- you're watching that last night, and not only is it bad to watch the Celtics just get their faces kicked in, it's at the hands of the Brooklyn Nets. It's at the hands of Kyrie Irving, and this is the team eight years ago that you pillaged, and you had one of the greatest lopsided trades in the history of the NBA. And it was supposed to start, you know, it was supposed to be the reason why you were going to be, not to say the next super team, but you were going to be a legitimate NBA finals contender for years to come. And they almost got there and they were right on the cusp of it. And everything has gone completely and totally wrong for them in the last two to three years. And now here the Brooklyn Nets are the team that you destroyed, the team that you took advantage of. And here they are. And they're so much farther you know they're so much closer to a championship than you they might be the best team in the league they probably are and you are so far away from banner 18 right now i can't even describe how far away you like you're not even it's not happening like it's not happening anytime in the near future and man that is frustrating you were that close and that team so much closer than you oh that stinks you want to know what what makes it worth um worse uh, lauren and, and matthew is that there's the old adage in sports where Karma is a real thing because we all remember the trade back in 2013. Oh, the Celtics fleeced the Brooklyn Nets. Oh, this is Trader Danny at his finest. All it took, and I'm serious, all it took was five years, five years of that hard work leading up until what was supposed to be the moment, game seven of the Eastern Conference Finals 2018, the year that, that that the Celtics were not even supposed to be a win away from going to the NBA Finals. Remember, this is the same year that Gordon Hayward got injured within the first six minutes of that 17-18 season, and Kyrie Irving also got injured that March of, of 2018 as well. This team wasn't even supposed to get there, but they, they come within maybe a half of getting to the NBA Finals. And ever since then, and as you 
astutely put it, Matthew, it just went downhill. It went more downhill faster than a bulldozer going down the slope of a mountain. Like, I mean, goodness grief. Uh, Lauren, Matthew, am I crazy to say that at this point, there's only one person to truly blame for this? And it's not Brad Stevens, but I look at Danny Ainge in particular and say, this is your fault, and this is a byproduct of what's going on the last two years. I mean, listen, it, it, it is an organizational issue. And, and that's, you know, what's so frustrating with the Celtics right now is you can point, you know, you can point the finger at just about everybody. Mm-hmm. I think it does have to start with the general manager. He's the person who built this team. And if you look at the, you know, the lack of talent on this roster right now, and you compare where they were to, you know, three years ago, I mean, that's a mismanagement of assets. And that starts first and foremost, you know, at the hands of Danny Ainge. But I do think there's a tune out factor with the coach. I do think there's a, you know, just listen, Brown and Tatum are extraordinarily talented players. They've taken some steps personally, you know, in, in regards to, you know, their ability on the court, but you still shouldn't be a seven seed when you have two all-star players in the NBA. So that falls on them too. The problems run so deep with this organization and it's basically at every single level. And I listen, I think the Celtic, have good ownership too but there's too much of a I I guess kind of a a sense of comfort there you know I don't think ownership puts enough pressure on the GM the coach the players I think there are problems everywhere in the Celtics organization and that's how they've gotten to where they are like I don't think I'm I'm being too crazy and saying that they are so far away from a championship right now and that's completely and totally unacceptable where they were three years ago when they were on the cusp I mean they were arguably the best team in the Eastern Conference three years ago you know, they lose game seven at home, and here you are now. I mean, you, you can't just point the finger at one person. It's literally everybody, and, man, that's, that's a problem. Because you know what? If it were one person, you can make a change. How do you change an entire organization? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's the problem is people are so hell-bent on placing the blame on one specific person. It's, oh, Brad Stevens has got to go. It's uh, No, it's Danny Ainge when Matt said it perfectly. it's There's problems all throughout this organization, and, you know, it's not just a quick fix. It's not just, oh, like, we'll bring some new fresh voices in. I don't know what they have to do. I don't know if they literally just have to blow up the entire team to start fresh and just kind of build around Tatum and Brown. I don't know if they, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is because it's been a steady decline watching this team for the last three years, especially the last three years. And there's so much blame to go around. There's blame for everyone. There's plenty of it because when the team's fully healthy, they should never be a seven seed and they had their own health issues with injuries and COVID this year. But I mean, you're still a good team on paper and they just did not perform that way. And, you know, Danny Ainge deserves some blame. Brad Stevens deserves some blame. The players ownership, literally everybody. And it's just, how do you fix it? I don't know. I don't know. I fresh voices, fresh faces. I don't know if that's enough. You know, Lauren, real quick. It's, I know we're not in the business of saying, I don't know. Like that's obviously not what we do. That's absolutely the right way to describe this thing. How do you fix this? You don't, to be yep. totally honest, like you don't fix this overnight. And, and mm-hmm. that ultimately, I think, falls on Danny Ainge that they've gotten to the point where there is not one or two moves that you can make to get back to being a championship caliber team. They are so far away from that right now. It's, it's scary. I mean, it's really scary. And there is no overnight fix. Like if you change the coach, that doesn't change anything. If you change the GM, a new GM isn't going to be able to fix this overnight. You don't have assets outside of Brown and Tatum, and you don't want to get rid of those guys because you know what? You generally lose those trades in the NBA. When you trade the star player in the NBA, you lose those trades. So what do you do? Do you, you can't trade Kemba Walker. He's got a bum knee. Nobody would want him. He might have the worst contract in the league, to be totally honest. It's he does. at least on the short. You trade Marcus Smart. I mean, he's got value but not the value that he had a year ago and his contracts were running up and he's a role player. So like, what are you going to get a late first round pick for him? You know, like it's, th- there are no easy answers here and that's pretty terrifying. And you know, something like I says it's the slow grind. <laughs> oh, for sure. Like, you know, you know, it's funny because last summer I brought up a question on, um, on the Sugar Rights Show on 91.5 FM WMFO, which is on available on archive on the Sugar Rights podcast on iHeartRadio. I brought this question up at the end of the Eastern Conference Finals last summer. And I asked this question. I'm going to question I, I'm going to pose again now. And I think it's even more poignant now. And that question is, 
is Brad Stevens the right coach to lead this team to the NBA Finals? And my my answer last August was was a resounding no. I think it's amazing, and my this, this these were my reasons at the time. Number one, there, I felt like that this team and the locker room was starting to fall apart in terms of the message being well received by the by the players. You saw it last summer in the bubble. You start to see signs of crack in the foundation when when you heard about. Jalen Brown and Marcus Smart getting into a shouting match in the locker room, and then you you proceed that you, you proceed that by you go you go back to early in the season where where things seem to be okay, but the Celtics, in my opinion, they weren't that dominant team, but they were a good team, but they were not like in the top tier of teams in, in the Eastern Conference last season. But now you move ahead several months later, and okay, you you have Kimba Walker, who at that point you were hoping that he'd be healthy. You also bring, you bring in what you hope would be a good supporting cast in Jeff Teague and Tristan Thompson, which neither one of those guys have absolutely panned out here in Boston. And don't even get me started about Shimmy Ojale. I mean, th- he's been an absolute non-factor coming off the bench as well. So I look at the roster and I say, and Lauren, you bring up a good point. It's not just one thing. There's like holes on both sides of the Titanic. And this ship has gotten to a point where, hey, which one of you needs a life vest first? Because not all of you is going to make it. And it's just, it's so maddening that we've gotten to this point And that I feel, I feel that at times that the Boston media, and this is a general point that I'm making, that the Boston media in itself does not apply the same criticism that they would if this was the Boston Bruins who are floundering the way that they are, which which obviously they aren't currently, or if this was the Patriots in particularly, especially the Patriots or the Red Sox. Is that a fair assessment and take to make? Yeah, I mean, I think, listen, maybe this isn't necessarily the media, although I, I do think, you know, the Celtics beat is a little bit easier on the Celtics than, you know, say, uh, the Bruins beat is on the Bruins or, you know, the Red Sox beat is on the Red Sox. That's just, I don't know, my my analysis of how the beat covers the team. I mean, I know us at the Sports Hub, we've been brutal on the Celtics and we're, oh, yeah. you know, the rights holder, you know, and all that. So I don't think this is necessarily, you know, totally on us. I do think there is a difference between Celtics fans and Bruins fans and Red Sox fans, even though we're all the same people have a tendency to be more difficult on the Bruins and the Red Sox than they are on the Celtics and the Patriots. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, that's general. That's my assessment. I could be right. I could be wrong. That's just how I view it. Um, Real quick on what you said about Stevens, Shukri. um, I think he's a really good coach. I do. I think he's a really, really good coach. That doesn't mean he's the right guy for the job. And listen, this is the NBA where there's a shelf life on coaching in this league. Doc Rivers is one of the best coaches in the NBA. He's on his fourth stop. Tom Thibodeau's done a great job in New York. He's on his third stop. That's how it works in this league. You know, you, you don't hold a job for 20 years unless you're, you know, Greg Popovich. I mean, to be totally honest, or Eric Spolstra, who will get there. That is so extraordinarily rare. It doesn't happen. So I think Brad Stevens is a really good coach, but that doesn't mean that they don't need some type of change. And, you know, when Rick Grosbeck said on Felger and Maz, if we let Brad Stevens go, he'd be the most sought after coach in the NBA. Well, yeah, that's right. Cause he's a really good coach, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't necessarily be opposed to change, even though he is a really good coach. But if you've got guys tuning him out, I, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. And if you have guys tuning him out, like, it's not going to change next season. They're going to continue that. They're going to continue to kind of pave their own way and just be like, well, I'll listen to Stevens a little bit, or I'll listen to maybe what he says until it just becomes a whole issue where they're like, we're not even listening to him. And it becomes the players coaching the team. So, you know, I, I like Stevens too. I, I like him a lot. Very nice guy, but just, just because, you know, he's nice, just because he's a good coach doesn't mean he's the right coach. And, you know, change is good. People you know people are afraid of change, but change is good sometimes. And it's, I don't think people would have hard feelings toward Brad Stevens if he left slash got fired for no matter the reason he left. I feel like that it wouldn't be difficult or not difficult, but it wouldn't, people wouldn't be mad about it. And 
you know, maybe Celtics fans, they do get a little crazy at times, but it's just, I think they're getting impatient, rightfully so. And I think that as much, cha- they'll take as much change as they can get. But I think that it's going to be a very, very slow process. It's not just going to be like a big rebuild over the next year. It'll be like, oh, they're going to get rid of Stevens and then they're going to slowly build this team. And it's going to be like a two or three year process. Like Red Sox fans are going through it right now. So it's just, it's a, it's a process and it, they, I don't know. They, there's a lot of questions to be answered right now for the Celtics that, that don't have a lot of answers. You know, one thing that, that has stood out to me in terms of the, just the culture and, and a lot of it will be made over the next several days, whenever the Celtics season ends. We're, pres- we're all under the general agreement that it's going to end after round one, if we're being uh, completely honest. When is game four? Is it Sunday night? Uh, I think Celtics- it is Sunday, yeah. Yeah, the Celtics season ends uh, Sunday night. Have a great holiday weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Can we all go to Sully's after? I mean, since everything will be opened up again yeah. on, on Saturday. Lauren, is that a deal? <laughs> right, good. Yeah, we'll be Sully's. Absolutely. Great as far. I wish the fours were still there. Seriously. Oh, God. Great weekend, everybody. Enjoy your holiday Monday because the Celtics ain't playing on Tuesday or Wednesday. (laughs) Like, I mean, God, it is so frustrating to just think about. And I look at the Celtics team and I and I say, you know, if this team did not already have a lot to do with and we're going to get to the Bruins and I, but this game, game two last night, the part of it, part of it wasn't even so much as a result as it was what was said after the game, Kyrie Irving. And I'm sure we've all heard about the, um, the quote that he said last night in regards to like hoping that like, there aren't like any like subtleties or like, or like racist taunts flung toward, flung towards him, like when they, uh, when when they the Brooklyn Nets come for Game Three on Friday, and it got me thinking. We are aware, and I'm talking about, uh, uh, just overall, we are aware that Boston has an intense history with racism in the past. However, the timing of that comment could not have been at, could, have, could have been more worse. Number one, I look at Kyrie and I say, my guy. You really want to try to use that to deflect away from the fact that you literally burnt the Boston Celtics and his fan base. Literally, who stands in the middle of the garden and said, well, I'd like to come back if you, if you, if you have me. And then literally just go scorch earth in the locker room on the organization in the spring of 19 and think everything is going to be on oh, grapes and roses. Like, are, are, you, are you crazy? Lauren, I'll, I'll start with you. Like when you first heard that or you first saw the clip of his comments post game, what were some of your thoughts that, that, on the, that, that you had in regards to Kyrie and the type of potential reception that he sure is to receive on Friday night? Well, I don't think he did himself any favors. I'm sure that you know, whatever reaction that fans wanted to give him in his return to TD Garden with fans is just going to be 10 times worse now. Just booze, taunts. I think he's going to get booed every time he touches the ball. Like it's, it's going to be loud and it's going to be, it's going to be a lot. Um, You know, when I first heard the comments first, I was just like, Oh no, like this is not going to go over well. We know we've seen these comments before made by other athletes. Um, But I think, you know, Kyrie explained why he went to the nets. He explained everything. He doesn't need to explain himself, but just own up to it at this point. Like you, it's been what, three, two seasons, whatever it's been, I can't keep track anymore. But, you know, I think everyone just needs to get over the fact that he's gone. He needs to get over the fact that he's going to get booed. He can't kind of dip out of this game, out of the series and avoid the fans. Like he's been able to with COVID and his injuries. Um, And it's also just, I mean, all he said was he didn't want, he was just Hopeful there'd be no subtle racism. And then everyone's like, oh, no one's ever said racist things to him. Blah, blah. I was like, oh, you didn't want subtle racism. Here you are, here you are. Guys, I like dropping subtle racism like all over the internet. But, yeah. you know, I, th- I think even if he didn't say that, he was getting booed. No way does he get any sort of standing ovation, any sort of warm welcome. He's going to get ridiculed um, for the way he left. But I think that his comments only add fuel to this this fire and this Kyrie hate that the Celtics fans have toward him. And like I said, it, it didn't do him any favor. So I think it'll certainly be interesting. I think tons of people will tune in just to see the reception and the reaction that, that the fans give him. But 
Not good. Not good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you describe it really well, Lauren. You know, we've we've heard comments like this from athletes before, and it is the vicious cycle of athlete makes a comment about Boston and, you know, it's racist past, maybe it's racist present, however you want to describe it and their experiences here or what they haven't experienced here. And then people get their backs up and they say, you know, I mean, we've been there, done that. The problem with Kyrie Irving is it's Kyrie Irving. Mm -hmm. It's the messenger. Here's a guy who said two years ago that he never experienced any racism in Boston. And who am I to say whether the man has actually experienced it or not? Who am I to say whether any athlete has ever experienced, you know, racism in Boston or not? I'm a white guy from Carver. I am not the person to say you've experienced this or you have not experienced this. That is like, I know my lane on this. The problem with Kyrie Irving is he's Kyrie Irving and he's still you know, white, black, what does it, it doesn't matter. He's still the most insufferable athlete that we've had come through this town in 20, you know, in, in my lifetime, that's for sure. And the messenger is the problem here, dude, you said you hadn't experienced this two years ago. Now you're coming back. Now you're criticizing the fans. Now you're, you know, saying, you know, things about subtle racism and stuff. It's only going to make it a thousand times worse for him. And I don't know if he gets that. I don't know if he doesn't get that. I don't know if he's just doing it to rile people up, which I, you know, wouldn't necessarily, you know, <laughs> rule out with Kyrie Irving. But mm-hmm. I'm not surprised he said it just based on everything. I mean, it's always something with this guy. It is always something. So I'm not surprised that, you know, we went here too. It's just, it's just, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not surprised at all. And, and you know what? It's not going to be a pleasant few days as a result. Oh, definitely won't be because I, I tweeted this out earlier on, on, on my Twitter. Follow me at, at uh, Shukri writes on Twitter. And I said, listen, here's the difference between Kyrie versus um, versus Casey Jones versus Cedric Maxwell, Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce. Yes. These are all men who are African-American as well. But the difference is that they didn't stand in front of a crowd of season ticket holders, promise that he'll return, literally destroy the locker room during that 2018-19 season, amongst other things. That's the difference. And to what you will um, put it, um, Matt, is that Kyrie comes with a lot of baggage. And we've seen that Jacqueline Hyde and his personality and his responses and interactions with the media during his time here. And it's, and it's just like, really? Okay. The problem is in fact, the messenger, not so much the experience because none of us can sit here and say that, well, he didn't go through that. Well, he didn't go through that. Like everybody's experience is different. Like that. that, I just want to make that like super abundantly clear. Like none of us have that right to, but part of the issue is that there's an article from two years ago that says that said that you said that you never experienced any subtle racism or even overt racism in Boston. Here, here you are two years later saying, well, I hope I don't, I'm not on the receiving end of subtle racism when I return, like, where, where's the consistency? And, and I think that's the most frustrating of, of them all. Yeah, no, listen, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say whether Kyrie Irving experienced racism in Boston or not. Of course. Or, you know, didn't experience racism two years ago. And then when he left, you know, some fans have, you know, shouted racist taunts at him or something like, I'm not going to, that's not my place to determine. That's not my place to decide. Um, Listen, if you hate the man because of a color of his skin, that just means you're the worst person. It really does. The problem is we have plenty of reasons to hate Kyrie Irving. Exactly. (laughs) He's an insufferable (laughs) diva. He's the worst. He's the absolute really worst, and it has nothing to do with the color of his skin. <laughs> it has to do with the way he acts, the things he says, you know, just the, the fact that he seems to think he's, you know, so much more enlightened than the rest oh. of us. I mean, oh. get out of here. Like, there's nothing worse than a guy who thinks he's better than you, and that's exactly. Kyrie Irving. It has nothing to do, you know, for me and the vast majority of Celtics fans with the color of his skin. I don't rule out the fact that there are people out there who hate Kyrie Irving because of the color of his skin. And boy, are they in the wrong for that? Boy, are they Mm -hmm. just the worst people on earth, really? But the vast majority of us, Kyrie, that's not why we hate you. Trust you. Trust me on that. (laughs) 
<laughs> Lauren. Because we got lied to right to our faces. Like we're all Ex- on like Exactly. It's, it's, that's what it all comes down to is like it's it's how he left. And like, you know, Matt said it perfectly. I'm not gonna sit here and say that Kyrie never faced racism. I'm in Boston. I'm sure that it, I'm there's plenty of stories out there and I'm not here to call him a liar because that's, you know, I'm, I'm just a white girl from, from Marlboro. Like I, I don't have any, I don't have anything to say about people like facing racism or anything, but you know, Matt said it perfectly. Same reason for me. I don't like Kyrie, it's just how he left. He's an incredible ball player. There is absolutely no denying his talent, but the baggage, the drama, it just was not worth it for the time he was here and people got sick of his act here and people just got sick of hearing, oh, this is why he's not playing. This is why he didn't uh, perform well. It's, it's Gordon Hayward's fault. It's this, it's that. It's every excuse in the book. And I feel like he doesn't hold him. I'm, I shouldn't say he doesn't hold himself accountable, but I just felt like there was no accountability while he was here. Mm-hmm. And now he's coming back to face the fans. And it's going to suck. It's going to suck for him. But, it, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that people reacted yesterday the way that they did. And I just hope that it, you know, when people boo him, it's because he said, I want to be the reason nobody wears number 11 ever again. And it didn't happen. It, it, it came very, didn't even come close to happening. Exactly. I want to shift from Celtics to, to Bruins and a bit more on a funnier topic, but, but somewhat serious can, and I want to start with you, Lauren, can, can you please address Bruin fans and tell them, Stop with the two Karask and Jeremy Swayman conversations. Like, God, I, I, I love Bruin fans, but it's beginning to piss me off on Twitter. Like, what more does this man need to prove in this, in this series that just ended against the Capitals that, hey, he was the reason why he stood on his head and the Bruins are about to play in round number two. Like, what else does he need to prove to Bruin fans that this whole conversation of, well, when is Jeremy Swimmer going to, going to get, have time to play in net during the playoffs? Like, can, can we put an end to this now? <laughs> no, because he hasn't won a cup. <laughs> <laughs> it's unfortunate. That's what he Come on! <laughs> he, I am not on this Tuka hate train. Like, people are very, very intense with this Tuka hate. Um, but that's – he can he can go to the Stanley Cup final again this year, but if he loses again, it's going to be – well, he sucks, can't win big games, and he's never there for his team, even though he's the winningest goalie in this category, in that court category. Like, he, he's surpassed Jerry Cheevers. People just don't pass Jerry Cheevers. Like, he's one of the greatest goalies in the NHL, the NHL has seen. And it's just, I think it's almost that people get off on hating Tuca so much that it's just, like, it's fun to do, and it's, like, they can't, God forbid they place blame anywhere else on the team, even though it's, I don't know, the Bruins defense, they gave up six goals. Oh, to his fault. Mm-mm. Nope, they lost. They lost six to one. It's Tuka's fault. It's like, what? Like, <laughs> Matt Griffin scored the only goal in game seven of the 2019 Cup final. Like, and yes, he's a puck mover and he has scored goals, but he, that's not his job, is to, is not, it's to defend the puck well. And where was the top line during the 2019 final? Oh, no, no, it was Tuka's fault. Okay, whatever. It's just, I don't know. Tuka could save their dog from drowning and they'd be like, Mm, still not good enough whatever you still suck man <laughs> so it's just it, he he could go on to sweep the islanders or the penguins next next series he could go on he could win the next eight games it do, doesn't matter until he is in the net on a clinching stanley cup game and i don't even know if the hate would stop that whether Matthew. it's fair or not that's ultimately how you know a large portion of bruins fans are going to feel about tuka rask and I have been very much in the middle on Tuka Rask, which I don't know. I feel like it's such a polarizing thing. You either love him and you'll defend him to the point where, uh, you know, you really don't see his faults or you hate him and you refuse to give him, you know, any credit for the way he plays when he mm-hmm. plays really well, which is the vast majority of the time. He is a very good goalie. Uh, I thought he was for the most part outstanding in this series. Uh, he was really, really good. I wanted him to make the save in game one. I I know it's a deflected puck, but if it hits you in the eight spoke B, it probably shouldn't trickle through your legs. That's just me. Maybe I'm being too harsh on him. A lot of hockey people said I was too harsh on Tuka Rask. (laughs) I'll acknowledge that. 
Comical. He was fantastic. He was fantastic for the rest of the series. The Bruins had a decided advantage in net for the vast majority of the series, really with the exception of game three, where I thought Sam Sonoff was outstanding, you know, until he cost the Capitals the game, which Tuka Rask did not do. Uh, and they won it in five in large part due to Tuka Rask. But Lauren, you're right. I mean, here's the thing. He's a really, really good goalie. He's been a really, really good goalie for a decade. He's been one of the best goalies consistently in the NHL for a long, long time. He's one of the greatest goalies in the history of the Bruins franchise. I understand all of that. He has to win a cup. He does because it's the only thing he hasn't accomplished. I mean, listen, all-star quality goalie, Vesna quality goalie. He's been there. He's done that, except he has not won a cup. So it's the only thing that Tukarask needs to do to change the minds of people because he can't do anything else like he can play at an extraordinarily high level and that's not going to change people's minds people are too dug in on Tuka Rask and the only thing that can change it is if he wins the cup um, you know he's reached the point where and not that he's the quality of player that Alex Rodriguez was in baseball or Peyton Manning was in football but we he's reached that point or you know David Price in in baseball you know like you can win Cy Youngs. You can be a really, really good pitcher in baseball for a long time, but you have to be on the mound in October and deliver. And Rask is one of those athletes who has, rightly or wrongly, however you want to say it, no matter what side you're on, and again, I'm firmly in the middle. I'm Switzerland on Tuka Rask, <laughs> all right? Firmly in the middle here. He's got to win a cup. He has to. Otherwise, he's not going to convince people. I'm not mad at you for being in the middle. But although in my mind, to be honest, I was like, pick a side. Come on. <laughs> like this is, this is a quality Mike <laughs> Felger fence sitting opinion. People say, oh, McCarthy or a lot like me. I'm, I'm sitting the fence on this one. I'm firmly in the middle on the two Karask thing. Come on. Like you, 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 you're, you're killing me. And you, looking back at game one and games one and two in particular, because I, I watched game one while I was, while I was, um I was on the road and I remember, the first several minutes of that game, I mean, good God, the physicality in, in game one, I was concerned because my thoughts in my mind were as one, are the Bruins going to be able to withstand the physicality and the punishing hits that Ovechkin was seemingly delivering on the Bruins' um, best players? And secondly, I wondered when was Tom Wilson going to show up? And I don't mean offensively either. I mean, when is he going to have the Tom Wilson moment that he had against the Rangers? But something changed in game two where I felt like there was a, a little bit of a shift, if you will, where I felt like the Tom Wilson effect and as well as the Capitals defense began to show cracks and the eventual Bruins come from behind win, which Taylor Hall um, scored on um, the tying goal. And I mean, Taylor Hall has been absolutely magnificent. I'm going get, to get to him a little later on. So I'll, I'll start with, with, with you, Lauren, over real quick. Is it fair to say that there was a moment that the Bruins figured out something with the Capitals' defense that they were able to exploit in game two that consequently turned the tide in this series? Yeah, I think so. And I think it was the Bruins played their way. They didn't succumb to playing how the Capitals play and playing the Capitals game and giving into, you know, dumb fights, even though Marshan took a couple of bad penalties there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, they they stuck to their game, which was incredibly important because if you're going, the Capitals are getting under your skin, you're going in the box, you're letting up these goals and it's just not worth it. But once they're down, once they're down one nothing, you know, they're not coming back to the TD Garden down to nothing they, they knew that even though it's game two it's a must-win game and they made their their smallest adjustments they are still passing a little too much in game two but it worked and it's just the matter of those smaller adjustments not giving into how the capitals are playing not letting them get under your skin and just taking advantage of their smallest mistakes and capitalizing on using the Bruins speed and getting around the capitals I and mean, they're beating them on pucks they're beating them on, on the boards that's what they needed to do. And that's the adjustments that were made from game one to game two. You know, I, I thought the professionalism of the Bruins in this series really stood out, particularly as the series went along, because I think it's a great point, Lauren. You know, the, the Capitals are the type of team that baits you into, you know, stupid penalties, stupid mistakes. 
and the Bruins did commit their fair share of them. Uh, the vast majority of them were Brad Marchand. Mm-hmm. Um, but two key things here. One is as the series went along, as the Bruins got more comfortable, not to say within their own skins, but with, within the, the context of the series, when the Bruins took control of this, they never relinquished it because, again, the professionalism of that team, they played their style, their brand of hockey, particularly as the series went along and good for them. You know, I thought they didn't play all that well early on in the series. They didn't panic. They just came out. They did their thing. They figured it out. And once they figured it out, they took complete control of this series and they never relinquished that control. It also did help that their penalty penalty kill was outstanding, was absolutely outstanding in the series. And I think it was a reflection on the Capitals, too. They refused to change anything up on that power play. That power play is elite. They refused to do anything about it. And the Bruins had the answers all series long. The Capitals did not change their approach and their philosophy on the power play. I thought that was a reflection on coaching. And I think there was a a reflection on leadership in this series as well. The Bruins obviously have very strong leadership and the Capitals. I'm sorry, you lose in five in what is, I think, a relatively evenly matched series. I mean, I'd pick the Bruins. I think they're a more talented team, but it's not by that much. It really isn't. Ovechkin loses his mind in game three, snaps his stick, calls his goalie a bitch, and then probably threatened to send him off to the gulag. Like, I mean, let's be honest. Like, uh, what the hell? And then you go out, you get your asses kicked in game four, and then you go back home in game five and you lose that game at home. I mean, Lauren, you know this better than I, that never happens in hockey. There's always a response. You don't lose games at home when your backs are against the wall. You come out strong in games and all that. The Capitals didn't show up for the vast majority of that game. They were strong in the third period because they had to be, but by that point it was pretty much over. I mean, it's just, I thought such a reflection on leadership, a reflection on Ovechkin, a reflection on really that entire organization. And Mm -hmm. meanwhile, the Bruins were a professional bunch and they got the job done. And when they took control, they never gave it back. Bravo to them. That Capitals team deserves bad things and the Bruins brought bad things upon them. You know, it was a heck of a series, but I had the Bruins going in seven because the Washington Capitals don't lose when their backs, when they're facing elimination, they don't. They, they should have pushed this to seven or at least six, and they couldn't. And like you said, I think that that certainly falls on Ovechkin, that, that leadership there. Like that's your captain. That's who's been around for so long, who knows his team. And he's throwing people under the bus, he's screaming at you. And look, tensions, are, tensions are high. That's fine. It's playoff hockey. But can't be like screaming at your players. Like he made mm-hmm. a mistake. It's a dumb mistake. I don't know if Tristan Jari got reamed out for what he did the other night against the Islanders. <laughs> It's like all time blunder. <laughs> all time blunder indeed. But I'm just like, I really thought that the Capitals were gonna run away with game five. I really thought it was gonna be like a blowout. And I then it was like this game's gonna get really, really ugly. And it never did because the Bruins just held their own. And I was like, oh no, like this is gonna be a dangerous Bruins team if they keep doing this. This is what I want to know. Did Sidney Crosby call Tristan Jari a bitch after that? Like, I'm not sure. That's what I, that's what I want to know. Did he call him a bitch in Canadian? I don't you know, think like- I don't think he did. And and, and, that, and that's the part that I, I got that gets me thinking. You talk about <clears throat> pardon me, you talk about strong leadership and strong leadership had never been more apparent than in game two, where I mentioned a little earlier about the, the, the Taylor Hall goal that was scored to tie up the game late in, in game two. But how about Brad Marshawn? Being part of the core, that core, that core that won the cup 10 years ago and, and the experience of having played in meaningful Stanley Cup playoff games. How important was the leadership of Marshan in particular in that game two to not just in terms of the scoring the, the overtime winning goal, but as well as basically willfully dragging this team to a win in, in what ultimately turned the tide in the series. Yeah, I think that um, Martian is incredibly important to this team. I think that that goes without saying, but I also think too, it shows that the maturity in his game over the last few years, he still, yes, he did take those stupid penalties, but it could have been so much worse. And they were, the Capitals know what they're getting with Martian. Everyone knows what Martian, who Martian is in the league. And it's easy to get under his skin. He's, it's easy to agitate him. He's going to poke you. He's going to, he's going to get, he's going to retaliate, but I think it goes to show that not only his leadership, but Bergeron, because I know that Marshan had said that Bergeron like reeled me in. It was like, we're not doing this like enough. We're all, we're done here. And even Don Sweeney spoke to that the other day. He was just like, you know, credit to Bergeron. I just think 
all around just this whole leadership where Bergeron telling Marchand like we're not doing this then Marchand understanding it not being like okay dad got it and then just like, going out behind his back and doing it again it's the and just being available and being that that true leader that the team the te- all teams need but the team needs specifically in the playoffs and you have Bergeron the soft-spoken captain who's you know he he's not gonna ream you out in front of your own players but he like you know he pulled Marshall aside and I was like stop taking these penalties we need you on the ice and then just helping lead his team to the win it's so so important and I think the leadership runs deep in this team you know Bergeron's the captain but he knows that he's not the only one leading this team it, it, it's it's Craig Smith sometimes it's Brad Marshall it's Tuka Rask it's all these players it's David Krejci it's just the the leadership the veteran roles here are just so so important it's going to be important throughout the series yeah, it's absolutely critical. And again, you saw the difference between the Bruins and the Capitals when it comes to leadership. Ovechkin's losing his mind. I can guarantee you that Patrice Bergeron did not call Brad Marsh in a bitch in French. I can just pretty much guarantee you that. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, but I, I could not believe when I when I saw the clip. And it's apparently there, it's incredible. There was a Russian like lip reader and someone actually like translated. It was like, he said, What? Like, I'm sorry, like, and I know I'm about to, you know, go on a little bit of a vicious history, but you never, ever hear Sedan Ochoa call Tuka Rask, like, any, any insulting names on, on, on camera, let alone, like, out, out in, like, where everyone can see. I mean, I don't know if it's happening, like, behind the scenes, but, I mean, that kind of showed itself when they were in the handshake line where, like, it was like, hi, bye. Did either one of you catch that, by the way? Like, what, what was up with that where between, between Chara and Rask? I don't know. I don't, it's like, <laughs> you know, I think Chara was in a very weird position that that was his team for 14, 15 years. That he was the captain of that team. He was the leadership. People looked up to him. People still look up to him and respect him. But, you know, it's a very, very bittersweet thing for him when it's like his teammates are going after his old teammates and he has to grab his new teammates. I'm like, don't do that. And then it's like, but then he's going after Jared Tenorti. Like, you know, it's not, not oh, actually, yeah. like going after. You know, it's, it's, a. Uh, I think it just puts him in a weird spot, but I think he did, you know, whatever. It's just like, I don't think anyone's going to go after Char. I think he'd be stupid to go after Char regardless of what team you play for, but very, very, uh, very weird moment for him there. Yeah, it, it, it does still feel like in some ways, not to say the ghost of Zidane Chara is, is hanging over the Bruins here a little bit this year, but if, you know, if the blue line does become a problem here in the playoffs and who knows, you know, if it will, or if it will not, um, I think they've been very good so far, but again, not a lot of experience there. I mean, you know, it's, you've got some guys, some guys who have been there, you know, Grizzly, uh, Carlo McAvoy, but I don't know, is, is Matt Grizzly, you know, a top pairing defense, but not to say that, you know, is Zidane Ochara a top pairing defenseman at this point? He's, you know, not, I mean, I, I still think he gives you something. But it was interesting to see the handshake line the other night. And you're kind of like, all right, you know, in some ways, the ghost of Chara is still here because if that's at any point a problem in the Stanley Cup playoffs, and maybe it will be, maybe it won't be, we don't know. That's going to be one of the first things fans are going to point to. And you're going to say, well, should you have had the experience of a guy like Chara? Yes, no, maybe. So we don't know that. But let's be real here. It has, it has, that discussion point has been out there since ever, ever since he signed with the Capitals. So we'll see. Oh, absolutely. And speaking of the blue line, we got to talk about Charlie McAvoy because, <clears throat> because we saw that moment between Shower and McAvoy on the handshake line in which that you saw this was the captain. And, and Lauren, as you put it, um, put it well, he was the leader for 15 years. He was the captain. He, the guy that single-handedly changed the course of this franchise starting when he first signed in, in 2006. And you go to when McAvoy first got the call prior to the beginning of the 2017 Stanley Cup playoffs against Ottawa, how much Char took him under his wing. And he knew at the time that this is going to be the next great Bruin defenseman to what he is now. How much of a maturity and growth that you've seen in his game. And Lauren, I'll ask you. The impact of McAvoy's growth in his game on, in, on this series. How much do you think the Bruins will continue to lean on that? The deeper that this team goes in the playoffs, 
And has he already in your eyes molded himself into being one of the top premier defensemen in the NHL? Yeah, I, I certainly think he's getting there. I mean, he quietly had a, a very strong year and it's even going now it's carrying that momentum into the playoffs. And he had a lot to take on this season with Char being gone, Krug being gone. He was the guy that, you know, they kind of look to and be like, this is your top line now. This, this is your blue line now. Like you need to, you know, I know he's only what, 24 years old, something like that. He, yeah. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> what a child. I know, right? <laughs> he's still so young, isn't he? <laughs> I feel like he's been here forever. Yeah. But- I, I, had a, I had a big birthday a few days ago, and I'm like, oh, 23. Oh, boy, you are a kid, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very disheartening to be closer to the, the oldest Bruin on the roster than the youngest. I'm like, oh, is that that's how it's going. <laughs> But, you know, yeah. McAvoy, he's really just owned this blue line and he's really come into his own. And he's he was kind of forced to this year. He had to form his own identity. Not that he didn't have it earlier, but now it's all eyes on him now. Um, he's He's got a big body. He throws his weight around. He moves the puck and he's he makes his impact felt on the ice. And that's incredibly important. And I think he learned a lot from Chara in the last couple of years with him. And now that he has to come into his own and he has to play, you know, he doesn't have Char to lean on. People now lean on him. And I think he just completely owns it. I think that he's very confident in his game. Obviously, the Bruins are very confident in his game. And, it's, it's, I mean, it's only going to go up from here, right? It has to. And he's just, like I said, he quietly had a very, very good season. And people aren't talking about it enough. And I don't know if that's just because there's other big names in the league or because it's maybe people are talking about it. I'm just not listening close enough. But, I mean, this is, this is Charlie McAvoy's blue line for years to come. I think you can make the argument that he is the most irreplaceable player on the Bruins right now for this Stanley Cup run. And I will make that argument. That's not to say that he's the best player on the team. I mean, he's certainly right up there. But let's just say for the sake of discussion that Tuka Rask got hurt. And listen, you never know with, you know, the back and everything. Jeremy Swayman, I think, could step in and do a good job. Uh, If Bergeron got hurt, if, you know, Pasternak or Marchand got hurt. The addition of a guy like Taylor Hall can take some of, you know, the the scoring onus away from one of those players. If somebody were to get hurt, they do not have a replacement for Charlie McAvoy. They flat out don't. I think he's the most irreplaceable player on the team, not only because, you know, just philosophically, I feel like in some ways, you know, your number one defenseman is kind of the backbone of your team. I mean, particularly if you're going to be a Stanley Cup winner, you need to have an elite number one defenseman. I firmly believe that. The Bruins do. I'm not sure if they have, you know, a number two defenseman right now. I mean, that's that's a you know different story. But as far as having a number one guy, I mean, McAvoy, he's it. And and he's capable of it. I mean, he led the team in, in ice time. Um, he was an absolute, I mean, he was a monster in that series. Uh, I mean, they, they put everything on him. And he was so, so good. I think he's the most irreplaceable player on the Bruins right now for this cup run. Without question, I think I wholeheartedly agree. And I, my reason is because... I look at McAvoy and I say, listen, this is a guy who who's contributed offensively. He he obviously is a is a top shutdown defenseman on this team right now. And I look at I look at this this blue line, and I say, McAvoy, not only is he the guy, but he's dominating offensively, defensively. He's been able to do it all. But if there's one concern that I do have, and that is the health of Kevin Miller. Because we saw that he, he got he got injured in, in game four. And thankfully for the time off that the Bruins have, he's able to use that time to, to get better. And Lauren, I'll ask you, moving forward, is it possible to overstate the importance of Kevin Miller for this blue line in terms of having that tough element in which that he was able to provide the first couple of games in this series against the Capitals? Yeah, listen, his loss is, it definitely hurts the blue line. He's he's built like a house. That man is an absolute unit. And he's never afraid to throw his weight around. He's a big, scary man, to put it politely. And, you know, it's it sucks to see him get injured again. And it sucks to see that it's, you know, an upper body injury here. Um, you know, he's worked so hard to come back with his knee issues, breaking it twice, missing all of 2020, all these setbacks, all these surgeries. And to see him healthy and contributing um, to this team in ways that they so desperately needed in 2019, even in 2020, that 
and now he's out again and there's still no timetable for his return. But I think the importance of Kevin Miller, I think it goes unnoticed. I think people are just, I don't know if they just don't like him. I don't know if they're just, they're mad because the Bruins quote unquote signed him over Chara um, on the first day of free agency. But when you are without Kevin Miller, I mean, you're still a good team, but you're not as good when he's on the ice. Yeah, I mean, listen, I thought he struggled in the early portions of the series before he got, you know, hurt, unfortunately, again. That's not to say that I don't really like the player and like what he gives you. I mean, he gives you a, a physicality that none of the other defensemen on this team can, can truly match when he's healthy and when he's going right. Um, and, you know, you go back to game, you know, the just the you know cup final against the Blues. You needed a guy like Kevin Miller in that series, mm-hmm. you know, who could withstand the hits, you know, that the, you know, the Blues, you know, were dishing out in that series. And, you know, I mean, particularly with that forecheck that St. Louis had, I mean, you know, it, the Bruins got beat up in that series and they needed somebody who could beat somebody up back and they didn't have enough of that. So that's not to say that you can't find it from other places. And maybe the Bruins aren't a little bit more built for that now than say they were two years ago, you know, with, you know, Nick Ritchie, you know, involved and contributing. And I mean, I don't know. I thought Tenorti gave them something um, in, in Miller's absence, you know, and he's a bigger guy. So, you know, listen, I, I, they need something like that. That's for sure. And ideally it's coming from Miller because he's just a better player than Tenorti. I did think he struggled early on in the series. You know, that's not to say he isn't, you know, a good player. And I, I hope he's back and I hope he gets healthy because he can contribute. I think one thing that people tend to overlook, especially when it comes to like uh, Kevin Miller, is that, as you mentioned, the physicality and, and especially in that cup final against St. Louis, which whom, by the way, and this is going to make me sick to say St. Louis has not won a playoff series since that Stanley Cup final. They just got swept by Colorado over the week over the weekend, um, which again makes me sick because it's like we, we really let one slip away. But that's besides the point. Oh, no, you, you that Bennington, that Bennington, that Bennington, he that is guy. a one hit wonder like uh, Kevin Little. Like, and if you don't know who Kevin Little is, Google him, please. And he's a nut job, too. <laughs> He's a complete and total nut job. Like every, every time I see a Jordan Bennington highlight, he's like trying to fight somebody. He's snapping his stick. It's like, Oh, you it's, lost to that guy. Oh, oh what a, kick, what a kick in the dick. Really <laughs> and we, and we lost a, We lost the standing cup finals to that guy. I mean, Lauren, please interject if you will. Cause I, 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 I've got nothing at the second. <laughs> <laughs> I actually wrote an article about just how bad he's been the other day in the playoffs since 2019. Give, give, drop, drop the plug, by the way, go ahead. Drop the plug. Um, uh, it's on Nesson.com. It's like Jordan Bennington has been downright awful. Like it just, and I was like, somebody had commented on Twitter and being like, um, Jordan Bennington, this is a terrible take. Jordan Bennington bailed his team out so many times, like not in the playoffs. Like (laughs) You can bail your team out in the regular season, but that man is 0-9 in playoffs since the Stanley cup. His save percentage is like 875. I think it was 899 or something in the, on the series against Colorado. And I know Colorado is a wagon like that. That is a tough team, but you embarrassed yourself. You are a Stanley cup winning goalie. You are, and it just makes you look like a fraud. Like you're zero and nine. You can't even win one. And easy. There's still there's still time to bounce back. Sure, but zero and nine is a tough record to come back from, and at least make it five hundred. He can do it in a season, sure, but he has to play out of his mind. And it's somewhat satisfying to watch. It certainly sucks because the Bruins did lose to him in 2019. But it's almost satisfying now, where it's like, okay, you're really not that good. Like it's like good Blues fans enjoy it because now you can just go hate on that goalie instead of Tuca and be like, worry about your own goalie and your own goalie problems. Because it's, if this is the Bennington you're getting like, for the rest of his career or his time with the blues, you guys are in trouble. This is a very, oh, yeah. very good contract. <laughs> and that, and that <laughs> contract is it, not going to be moved because we've seen like on uh, goalie contracts in the NHL, especially like contracts like Jacob Markstrom who signed with, with Calgary during the last off season, those contracts are not movable. Especially paying goalies what six million a year, and Jordan Bennington. I mean, he's he's not even worth that kind of money. But it's just like, ooh, I I, I really feel I feel bad. I feel bad for those teams. But speaking of teams, I do genuinely feel bad for the Capitals, and that is because, and I tweeted this out. I think it was yesterday or the day before, but I tweeted us and I said, listen, ever since the Capitals. And the Blues won their cups respectively in 18, 19. 
Neither team has won a playoff series. The Capitals, since they won the Santa Cup in 2018, 19, remember they lost in that in, in overtime in game seven to Carolina. 2020, last year. They who did they lose to? I think it was the Islanders, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And and as well as this year, obviously just losing on to, to the Bruins. I wonder if there is something within that organization that is potentially wrong. Because after all, Barry Trotz left after that 2018 Stanley Cup final to coach the Islanders. That team has not been able to get out of the first round. And I, I'm curious to get your get your take as to why is that and why is that this team has had such a lack of success in the Santa Cup playoffs since winning the Cup in 18? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a couple factors here. One, it is really, really freaking hard to win the Stanley Cup. And it goes to show you that everything needs to break your way, which is what makes 2019 hurt so much for the Bruins because – the path laid down for them. Yes. I mean, they didn't have to face the lightning. They got the blue jackets. Instead, they got Carolina in the Eastern conference finals. I mean, what a joke. I mm-hmm. mean, really? And then I thought San Jose was better than, than St. Louis. And I wanted St. Louis. Cause I'm like, well, this is an easier path. And it should have been an easier path because Jordan Bennington's a bum as we've established. And I knew it then. And we all knew it then. So at least we've got, at least we can say we were right. Don't have the cup for it, but at least we can say we were right. <laughs> Which we, you know, we all got into this business to say we were right. So yeah, at exactly. least we got that going for us. But you are right, Chuker. I mean, there is there's some loser still in that Capitals franchise. I'm sorry, there is. And I think it goes back to the leadership thing that we were talking about earlier. You know, they were they were always the disappointing team before they eventually won the cup, before they <laughs> got it right, lightning in a bottle, whatever. I mean they were always a massive disappointment and they've been a tremendous disappointment ever since. So there's a lot of institutional loser still in that franchise and never, ever doubt the institutional loser factor. It is real. I'm convinced of it. It's like, it's like my religion in sports. It's like uh, there's an institutional loser factor in your franchise and they still have it, man. They still do. I thought, I thought that would go away after having won something in a very least, but what do I know? Now, round two, opponents still to be determined. We don't know who we're facing. We're facing either the Islanders or the Penguins. But that that moment in game, what was it, game five between the Islanders and the Penguins, can we all talk about how much of a colossal brain fart that Tristan Jerry had to have had? Like, I mean... Goodness grief. And by, by the way, side note, I was listening to Felger Mass as I was making my way back home yesterday from the airport. And I heard the radio calls for, for, the, for the game-winning goal by Josh Bailey. You talk about the complete extreme ends of the spectrum. One is super excited. Josh Bailey with the game-winning goal! And then you have the legendary Mike Ling, like, Josh Bailey scores, game over. Like, it was like, what the hell? Damn. Okay. One knew that one knew that its goalie just committed a, a massive brain fart at the worst possible time. And the other team knew, like, oh, man, we got away with one. We have a chance to close them out. So, game six beckons tomorrow. Islanders, Penguins. If you're a Bruins fan, Lauren, who are you hoping to face in round two, the Islanders or the Penguins? Uh, I'm saying the Penguins because uh, I like their chances. Regular season stats don't matter, but they really struggle against the Islanders to the last two games of the series. Barry Trotz has the Bruins number for whatever reason. And give me Tristan Jari all the time. Like that, that little blunder just put so much more confidence in me that the Bruins can certainly beat the Penguins. Not that I don't think they can beat the Islanders. It's going to be a way tougher series, but I want the Penguins next series. It's, it's going to be hard. They're in New York tonight possible elimination game I think this is going to go in the Islanders favor but tonight I'm, I'm pulling for the Penguins yeah I mean as a Bruins fan I think you should be rooting for the Penguins as well for really all the reasons that you just laid out Lauren um, we do have to consider the fact that I mean the Islanders did have the Bruins number for the vast majority of the season because of the style of play the Islanders have right I mean they will kick your ass five on five and the Bruins up until the trading deadline were not a good five on five team we know the numbers we know the difference after they acquired hall and lazar how much better they've been five on five ever since so i do think they're much more capable of beating the islanders now 
uh, than they were at the beginning of the year. I, I would consider that series a pick 'em. And the goalie factor, too. I'm sorry, you would have a distinct advantage if Tristan Jari is the goaltender on the other end of the ice. So I want the Penguins. I don't think you get the Penguins. I think you get the Islanders. I am much more comfortable, however, with that matchup than I was, say, two months ago, because I was of the opinion that if you saw the Islanders in the playoffs, you were not going to beat them because your style of play was not conducive to beating that team. You are much more equipped now with Taylor Hall, given how much better you've been five on five since you acquired Taylor Hall. It changes the complexion of the entire team. They're so much better five on five. I think that series would be a pick 'em. I really do. I mean, I think it'd be a really good series, um, but I give the Bruins a hell of a lot more of a chance now than I would have two months ago. That's for sure. And I'm glad you brought that point up because Taylor Hall's addition catapulted this offense into being top five in terms of goal scoring per game. And you, we all know the defensive numbers. They've gotten even better in terms of goals allowed per game, um, like especially on five on five. And especially if you look at just that line alone, that Krejci, Craig Smith, and Taylor Hall line alone, they've been among the very best in the NHL in terms of goals allowed, in terms of plus minus. So I do think that that line, along, if they would have faced the Islanders, let's say, for example, Islanders close out the series, whether it's game six or in game seven, the Islanders and the way that they, they play, but that fourth line scares the hell out of me. With Cal Clutterbuck, Mike Martin, and, and, and Josh Brown on that fourth line, it scares me because that is a line that can create, that can absolutely wreak havoc against a top line, like obviously with, like with Marshawn Bergeron and Pasenak. So I'll, I'll ask you, if it's Bruins Islanders, if that were to happen, what is the number one concern that you would have in regards to the Islanders in terms of this style of play defending against the puck? I mean, well, I think we saw uh, saw it a lot in the in the regular season. Just that, you know, I know they're a different team now, but they the five on five, the secondary scoring was non-existent. I think that's a little more existent now with Charlie Coyle, Jake DeBrusque on that third line together. But I mean, my biggest concern is just. They're, they're a strong team. They're a pretty full team there, but it's kind of the same thing with the Capitals. The Bruins need to, well, they need to keep up with them, but they cannot give into their, their physicality, their little like taunts if they, that happens with Martian or whoever's on the ice there. Um, Islanders are a tough team. They're, they're a very, very good team. And they're, they, they intimidate me more going into the next series if they were to be, if they were to win tonight. But I think that, I, it's just, it's hard because I, I'm so, I'm hellbent on getting the Penguins, but it's the, the Islanders, they need to, the, the Bruins, I'm sorry. They need to continue to play their game. They need to beat, beat the Islanders to the puck. Do not like just be all over them. I feel like the Islanders were all over the Bruins this season, even in those last two games with the, the new look Bruins, they just need to just battle. They need to win these battles they need to win face-offs and they need to not be afraid to th throw their weight around against the Islanders. I'm just terrified of Barzal. I mean, because I just don't want to you oh, know, yeah. relive the 2015 draft for seven games in this series. <laughs> I mean, that guy, that guy owns the Bruins. He owns everybody else, but he owns the Bruins. And man, every time you see him, you know, score some ridiculous goal against the Bruins, I'm like, oh, this is a nice kick in the teeth here. Thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> Never feels good. Kyle Paul Mary, he's he has a ton of goals against the Bruins. Yeah, exactly. Even going back to when he was with the Devils, and even before yep. that, when he was with Anaheim, like, oh sure, let's That's like every goal you score happens against Boston. It's like uh, JG Pajot as well. It's oh, like every God. goal you score comes against the Bruins, right? Oh, the, the way to remind me, Matt. Thanks, man. Like seriously, just just the thought of it alone, like just makes just makes my brain just want to melt into just complete smush and. Ah, man, like, l listen, l last question I'll, I'll ask is this. If you, if you're the Bruins at this point, and based on what you've seen through the first five games of the Stanley Cup playoffs, what's the number one facet of its game that you think the team needs to work on in order to advance to, the, um, to I guess, the, the finals? You, you can't even say Eastern Conference finals because the divisions have been realigned for this season. Lauren, go ahead stop passing so damn much it's driving me insane and i understand craig anderson's in that you get him, get him off his mark 
little there because he's a little older. He can't move as quick as the younger guys. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. But you have an open lane. Oh my God, just shoot the puck. I can't, I hate being that person who screams shoot at the TV. And it's just like, there I was all series doing that. And they've always been pretty pass happy. This isn't really anything new, but if you have the open lane for the love of God, just shoot the puck and just be ready for the rebound because there's been a lot of juicy rebounds in the series mm-hmm. of the Capitals that could have easily been goals. But if I see even just one less pass, I will be a much happier person. I think, you know, what you saw from the power play at the end of that capital series was such a positive step because that power play was brutal at the beginning of that series. And, you know, by their lofty standards, again, you know, the Tory Kruger power play was arguably the best in the NHL. They really have not been that good by their standards on the power play this year. So seeing the steps they took at the end of that series, they need to keep that going. Now, listen, I do think, you know, five on five play is more important than power play. Uh, That's just, that's how you win the cup. It's they won in 2011 with a horrific power play Mm -hmm. in 2019. They had the best power play in the league. They didn't win. So I do think, you know, five on five is more important, but I want to see that power play be better. And they were better towards the end of that series. They got to keep that going. Without question. And I think that, that the, the power play will continue to get better, but I definitely agree with Lauren, like, and soon enough, in just a few days, the garden will be full with Bruin fans, whether if it's this weekend or even the beginning of next week, seeing a, a, a near full capacity to the garden screaming, shoot it! Like, God, I miss that so, so much. And with that being said, I want to say thank you immensely so much to both of you, Lauren Campbell of Nesson, Nesson.com, Matt McCarthy, 98 out the sports up. Thank you guys so much for coming on the podcast today. Hopefully I didn't uh, piss off too many um, Boston sports fans with the Celtics talk at the beginning, but if you pissed at me, just, just message me on Twitter at Shukri rights. So thank you guys so much. Great thank to be you. here. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to Matt. Finally, we've been connected on Twitter. It was nice to be on again. So thank you so, so much. No, likewise, Lauren, it was, you know, we've I, what been connecting on Twitter for years and it's nice to finally put a, a face to the name. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> for sure. Absolutely. My guys. <laughs>